Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a meaty middle about apostrophes, another meaty middle about writing for people with dyslexia, and a familect story about vacation. But first, support for today's show comes from Magoosh. Do you need to take a standardized test like the GRE, GMAT, LSAT, MCAT, or SAT? Magoosh Online Test Prep will give you the tools you need to get a great score, like study schedules, up-to-date practice sessions, video lessons, and support from expert tutors. Study anywhere, anytime, on desktop or mobile. Visit Magoosh, M-A-G-O-O-S-H dot com and enter the promo code GRAMMAR for a 15% discount. You didn't realize it at the time, but last week was part one of apostrophes, and today is part two. I said it in the last episode about apostrophes, and I'll say it again. There are some confusing situations when it comes to apostrophes. For example, Christine from Portland, Oregon, Judy from Traverse City, Michigan, Katie from Australia, Christy from Washington, D.C., and Rick from Las Vegas, Nevada, all asked how to make a singular word that ends in S possessive. And I know that this is a raging debate, even at the highest levels of government, because Tracy from Mountain View, California, and a listener named Armand both sent me a funny article a while ago describing U.S. Supreme Court squabbles over making the word Kansas possessive. Words such as Kansas that end with an S can be stumpers when it comes to apostrophes. Is it Kansas's statute with an apostrophe S or Kansas's statute with just an apostrophe at the end? Justice Clarence Thomas wrote the majority opinion and left off the extra S, referring to Kansas's statute with just an apostrophe at the end whereas Justice David Souter wrote the dissenting opinion and used a double S at the end of Kansas, writing about Kansas's statute with an apostrophe before the final S. So who's right? Well, they're both right, and they really should have a Supreme Court-style guide so their writing is consistent. They're both right because this isn't a rule. It's a style choice. Justice Thomas, whose name ends with an S, seems to favor AP style, which recommends leaving off the extra S. Justice Souter seems to prefer the recommendations of the Chicago Manual of Style, which says to add the apostrophe S to almost all singular nouns and names that end with S. Chicago used to make exceptions for names with two or more syllables that end in an E's sound, and nouns are names that end with an unpronounced S. So they were saying you should write names like Euripides and Descartes with an apostrophe and no extra S at the end. So you may have heard those rules, but the editors reversed their decision in the 16th edition of the stylebook. So now there are only two exceptions in Chicago for making words that end in S possessive. First, you still use a lone apostrophe to make what they call uninflected nouns possessive. Those are the rare birds for which the singular and plural are the same and end in S. So words like politics and economics. Second, you still use a lone apostrophe when making place names that end in a plural ending with S possessive, like the United States and Beverly Hills. So you'd write about Beverly Hills' recent tax height and politics' downside and both of those would have just an apostrophe and no extra S at the end of Beverly Hills and politics. Whew! So, that seems complicated, but remember, most of the time is simple. In AP style, you use a lone apostrophe to make singular nouns and names that end with S possessive. And in Chicago style, most of the time, you add an apostrophe and an S, with a few rare exceptions. So our first tough issue, how to make words that end with S possessive, doesn't actually have an answer. It's a style issue, and you can do it either way, depending on which style guide you follow. But at least it's simpler than it used to be. I always feel bad when the answer is that there isn't an answer. So here's an easier situation that has a firm rule. If the word ending with S is plural, such as aardvarks, when you're talking about more than one aardvark, then you just add an apostrophe to the end to make it possessive. 
For example, you could write, the aardvark's escape route was blocked, aardvark's apostrophe, to indicate that a family of aardvarks needed to find another way out of danger. Plural words that don't end with S, such as children, do take an apostrophe S at the end for possession. For example, you could write, Fortunately, the children's room had a hidden doorway, with children's written as children apostrophe S. Here's another tricky issue with a definite answer. How do you make the plural of a single letter, as in mind your P's and Q's? It's shocking, but you actually use the apostrophe before the S. It looks possessive, but it isn't. The apostrophe is just there to make it clear that you're writing about multiple P's and multiple Q's. The apostrophe is especially important when you're writing about A's, I's, and U's, because without the apostrophe, readers could easily think you're writing the words as, is, and us. That reminded me of what we talked about last week with single letters being referred to with the phrase per se when they were being used as a word instead of a letter, like I per se I to mean the word I. Finally, we'll end with another gray area. Brian in Toronto and a listener named Josh asked whether they should use apostrophes to make abbreviations plural. Brian gets irritated when he sees signs advertising CDs for sale with it written CD apostrophe S. Jan wrote in about the same thing, feeling a sense of horror after seeing CDs written with an apostrophe in the New York Times. Years ago, this used to be a style choice, and it was quite common for style guides to recommend using an apostrophe to make abbreviations plural. But as time went on, more and more style guides stopped recommending the apostrophe. And it's even more complicated than that. For example, along the way in early 2010, the New York Times and the Chicago Manual of Style used an apostrophe to make abbreviations that included periods plural, but not abbreviations without periods. So in the New York Times, you would see MDs, M period D period apostrophe S for the plural of MD, but PCs, PC lowercase s, no apostrophe, for the plural of PC for personal computer, because they wrote that without periods. But even they stopped this practice some time later. Today, the New York Times Style Guide and the Chicago Manual of Style both say not to use apostrophes to make abbreviations plural, whether they have periods or not. Thus endeth our apostrophe segment. Before we get to tips for writing for people with dyslexia, we're sponsored by Bank of America. Interested in making financial lives better through the power of every connection? Whether it's sending kids to college, building a dream home, or planning for retirement, as a Merrill Financial Advisor, you'd be an advocate for the power clients have to realize their goals and dreams on a daily basis. Take the first step by joining the Financial Advisor Development Program at careers.bankofamerica.com. This episode is also supported by a new Quick and Dirty Tips podcast called Relationship Doctor. Dr. Steven Snyder is a relationship therapist with more than 30 years of experience. And on his podcast, he gives advice to help you solve common relationship problems you didn't even know were holding you back. You'll hear advice on topics like how to express yourself in the right love language, how to sustain a long-distance relationship, how to protect your relationship from technology, and so much more. Whether you're single, newly committed, or further along, the Relationship Doctor's practical advice will help your partnerships thrive. You'll walk away with skills for better communication, intimacy, and romance. Learn to love better. Find Relationship Doctor wherever you listen to podcasts or read the transcripts at quickanddirtytips.com. Have you ever tried to read something in a foreign language? Maybe some words looked familiar, but it was hard to determine what the sentence meant. Maybe the structure didn't seem to follow the rules you're used to. Now imagine having the same problems reading your native language. Today, we're going to talk about how to write for a special group of readers, people with dyslexia. Before we get to the writing tips, you first need to know that dyslexia is a learning disability that affects reading. Some people see words or letters jumbled around. They might see left as felt or the letter P as B. 
They may not be able to understand jokes or idioms, and some have a hard time following complicated instructions. Dyslexia isn't a sign of low intelligence. In fact, some of the most successful people in history were dyslexic, including Albert Einstein, Walt Disney, and Roald Dahl. Dyslexia can't be cured, but reading specialists can help people cope with the problem. As a writer, you can help too. Dyslexia isn't the same for everyone, but most experts agree that these small changes can make reading easier for many people who have the condition. First, write short, simple sentences. Have you ever read a sentence that was so long you were lost by the end? Many dyslexic readers have that problem all the time. Keep your sentences brief, use short words, and use a simple subject-verb-object sentence structure. Keep your paragraph short, too. Use bulleted lists if it makes sense. If you're writing a list of instructions, break it down step by step, no matter how simple each step might be. Second, avoid using unnecessary abbreviations. Dyslexic readers have trouble keeping track of abbreviations, and avoiding them is actually a good tip no matter who your readers are. In his book, Garner's Modern American Usage, Brian Garner says overuse of abbreviation, quote, requires the reader to refer constantly to the original uses of terms to grasp the meaning. This kind of writing is tiresome and inconsiderate, unquote. In some cases, however, the long form is awkward or the abbreviation is more popular than the original term. For example, it's much easier to talk about a product's UPC than its universal product code. In cases like that, feel free to use the short version. Third, use boldface type for emphasis or headings. To people who have dyslexia, underlined or italicized words can look like they run together. Avoid using block capital letters, too. They can also be hard to read. Fourth, use just one space after sentence-ending punctuation, not two. This is a style choice, but many dyslexic readers prefer the single-space method because it makes the text easier to read. The extra space over many pages can create a river through the text. The website typographyforlawyers.com has a good picture of this. Fifth, keep screen readers in mind. Routinely used by the blind, a screen reader is a tool that reads text aloud. A good screen reader can interpret unusual spelling and punctuation, but no screen reader is foolproof. For example, curly quotation marks may be read aloud as back quote, so use straight quotation marks instead of curly ones. We've already said you should be careful with abbreviations. One more thing to consider is how you pronounce them. A screen reader will try to read them as words if there are enough vowels and consonants, but it'll pause if periods are inserted between the letters. You wouldn't shorten United States to the word us, so insert periods there, U period, S period. But you would say NASA for National Aeronautics and Space Administration, so write that one without periods. A final tip about screen readers is to take advantage of punctuation. A screen reader will pause for semicolons, commas, and ending punctuation, so make use of those marks at the ends of headings and bullet point statements. If that doesn't fit your style guide, put them in a font color that matches your background. Voila, people reading from the page will never know. Six, think a bit about design elements such as font and spacing. A plain, evenly spaced sans-serif font like Arial or Verdana in a 12 or 14 point size is your best bet. Verdana even has the straight quotation marks that will help screen reader users. The easiest layout to read is left justified with line spacing of 1.5. Use dark text on a light background, but don't use white. It's a bit too bright and hard on the eye. That last tip is also useful if you're writing for elderly readers or others with impaired vision. Finally, check the readability of your final draft. Readability is exactly what it sounds like, how easy your document will be for someone else to read. The most common tool to test this is the Flesh Reading Ease Scale. Developed in the 1940s by author and writing consultant Rudolf Flesch, the scale calculates a score between 0 and 100 using word and sentence length. A higher score means a more readable document, and a score of 70 or above is generally considered good. Microsoft Word has a flash score calculator built in. You can turn it on in your preferences menu. 
If your score is lower than you'd like it to be, check each paragraph separately to identify trouble spots. Note, however, that the flesh scale measures only word and sentence length, not design elements. As noted earlier, sometimes the recommendations for making your writing accessible conflict with the recommendations of popular style guides. For example, although putting periods in the abbreviation U.S. helps people who use screen readers, the Chicago Manual of Style recommendation is to write U.S. without the periods. If you're required to follow a certain style, you may need to balance that requirement with accessibility, or you can petition your editor or employer to make some style exceptions. Some of these concepts may be hard to understand if you're not dyslexic, but most of these tips make good sense no matter who your audience is. Keep it simple, and you won't go wrong. That segment was written by writer and editor Erica Grotto. You can find her on Twitter as Bewerica, B-E-W-A-R-I-K-A. Finally, I have a familect story about a vacation word. Hey, Grammar Girl. First-time caller, long-time listener. I don't have a fam elect, but rather an employee elect or work elect, whichever portmanteau you'd prefer to call it. I had requested time off from work via email to my manager. They then responded to that email with, would you like to take vacay time or make up the out-of-office hours throughout the week? Of course, vacay, short for vacation. There really isn't a standard way to write out the slang for vacation, vacay, so they wrote it V-A-C-A. And this, of course, is a Spanish word for cow. I wrote back with a jovial, of course I'd love some cow time. I was immediately responded to with a cow with a bolded and terror bang behind it. I gave the explanation behind my meeting, and now that any time someone in our department wants to take off from work, we ask for cow time. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the podcast. Thank you. I love that, especially after the recent show we did about vacation words like vacay, which actually was admitted to the Oxford English Dictionary with the spelling V-A-C-A-Y in 2013 as a North American colloquial term. A lot of you have asked me how to spell familect, and this story offers a good jumping off point since he called his phrase an employee elect or a work elect. A familect is a word that your family, and likely only your family, uses. It's a blend or portmanteau of the words family and dialect, familect, F-A-M-I-L-E-C-T. And if you want to tell me your familect story, you can leave a voicemail at 83-321-4-GIRL. I'm Mignon Fogarty, Grammar Girl and author of the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips, for better writing. You can find me at quickanddirtytips.com, and thanks to my audio producer, Nathan Sams. If you need to know AP style for work, I have a webinar coming up August 20th. I'll teach you how to write dates according to AP style, what to do when quotations don't match AP style, what wonders await in the new health and science chapter, and a whole bunch more. Sign up at bit.ly slash apstyle2019. I'll put that link in the show description that you should be able to see in your podcast player. And if you aren't already subscribed to my weekly email newsletter, you can do that at quickanddirtytips.com using the subscribe link at the top of the page. We always announce everything in the email newsletter. That's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>